thank you uh, to, to all um, participants on, on, on this conference. Uh, I have to tell you it was uh, not always an easy ride, uh, if I may say so, because it was the first time that the three institutions together uh, have uh, organized such a conference. Uh, in the past, the, the last convention, I remember uh, that, uh, was Prime Minister at that time when we launched the convention was an initiative by the Council where the other institutions were invited. This time it was a conference organized by the three institutions uh, where uh, as equals uh, we invited the citizens and the social partners and the civil society to participate. And it's a little bit like uh, the French say a, a ménage à trois. Huh? It's not always easy. But, yeah, it's interesting, and uh, I think that the, we, <laughs> we, we can say that we produce something, not only the babies that have been born during the conference, but also 325 uh, conclusions. And I think that uh, the, the lesson that we have to learn from this, uh, for European democracy, but I think also for every national democratic system, uh, is that, as I said already yesterday, uh, you need to have in, in modern democracy, besides the enormous influence of uh, social media and internet platforms in democracy, a permanent system of uh, citizens' participation uh, next uh, to a representative democracy. And I think uh, that... Uh, at least the conference will realize that, that every five years between the elections, a European election, there is a midterm. In the US, what do they do with the midterm? They change half of the, of the parliament, half of the uh, Senate uh, in America. But I think we could easily, based on our experience, organize every midterm an exercise like this as a guidance uh, for... European Parliament for the European Commission of what needs to be done uh, in the upcoming years. So I believe firmly uh, that uh, we need to reflect and to work uh, on a permanent uh, citizens' representation uh, and an exercise like this. <laughs> Secondly, there has a, a lot been said uh, about uh, treaty change, yes, treaty change, no. I think we avoid the trap. That is to have a conference that from day one until the last day only talked about that. We said from in the beginning that we didn't mention treaty change in the common declaration starting uh, the whole conference, especially to avoid that. We needed to talk about content, about substance. And then comes the second question, the question that you have Many of you already raised also in the conclusions, do you need for that treaty change or not? And that will be the, the next big discussion in the Union. And as I said yesterday, I can only talk for the European Parliament on this. European Parliament will take its responsibilities and will next week, in a vote, we will see if there is a majority, but I'm confident about that, express itself on the need for a treaty change. And I know how the article works and the treaty works, then it will be a search for a majority in the Council to make that possible. But there will be no search in the Council if there is first not uh, the decision by the European Parliament. Both institutions have to work together uh, on this. And I'm thankful to all those uh, during our debates, uh, the representative of the Italian government, the representative of the German government and the Bundestag, the representative of the Slovak government and from many others who have expressed already now at uh, this stage their support to do that, to go in that direction. And why is it necessary? Why is it necessary? Well, not because of a power struggle between institutions. Sorry, we are not in that stage. We are not in the stage of, oh, do we need a little bit more power for the council or the parliament, or the commission? It's not what is at stake. What is at stake for the moment is the liberal, democratic, European model that is under attack from inside and from outside. That is at stake. 
And so, if we look to the question convention or treaty change, that needs to be our goal. Are we ready for the new world order of tomorrow? And the answer for the moment is not totally. Can the European model survive in the world of tomorrow? That are the big questions that we need to answer. And that is the reason why we need to answer the question of the treaties. There has been said yet it's a historic moment, this conference. I'm a little bit more cautious because about historic moments in politics, I have heard them a few <laughs> times in my life. This conference will be historic at the moment that we are capable to deliver and to implement what has been decided. Then it becomes a historic moment. So, so that responsibility is in our hands now as politicians to make your work historical and to make also your work yeah, a permanent tool of the Union. Because let's be honest, what you have done with the conclusions of the conference is in fact to return to the legacy of the founding fathers of the European Union. In 1945, in 1945, they started the journey of the European project based on the devastation from the Second World War. We are 77 years later. There is a new war raging in Europe. So it's time to go back to the legacy of the Founding Fathers. It's time to go back to their dream, to their initial objectives, that is creating a real European unity, a real European integration. Not because it's a dream, but because today it's a necessity. Like I said, a revival of the ideas of the Founding Fathers through the conclusions of the conference is necessary for the survival of our beautiful continent. So thank you very much. And the last thing what I have to do is the most amazing one, because I can invite you now, finally, to the drink that will be served in the canteen uh, of the Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.